Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, HTTP Builder NG and it's back from the dead. So just first a little bit about me if you don't know me yet. My name is Noam. I work for probably the coolest company on earth called Healthy.io. We basically work to certify your uh, cell phone as a medical device. Really interesting stuff, so check it out. And you can also see all the crap I tweet uh, at Noam Tanner and the stuff I blog at blog.tanner.org. So if we're ready, I think we can get going. You notice like a zombie theme going around here in this, uh, in this presentation. So sometimes I do, you know, you'll see it. <laughs> so first, let's see um, what sort of users am I facing today. So obviously you came to talk about HP Builder NG, like a REST client. So are any of you today already using HP Builder NG, the new library? You guys, you two have graduated my class, so if you'd like, you're free to go. Don't go. <laughs> um, so how many of you are using Apache, uh, HTTP client? A couple, a little bit more popular. OK, HTTP by Square. No one, OK, that's surprising as well. And how many of you are using core Java? <laughs> yes, brave, sir, very brave. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about HTTP Builder the old one, because, well, it came to talk called HP Builder NG, which means it's a new generation or next generation, however you'd like to call it. That means there was a previous version. So HP Builder was an HP slash REST library that existed since more or less the early days uh, of Groovy. Now, I'm not saying it's bad, okay, but I'm also not here to bash the old HP Builder. So HP Builder was a library created by a, a dude named Jason Gritman, very smart guy, and he created a really, really good initial version of what would an HTTP REST client look like in the world of Groovy, using DSLs, uh, using closures, and all that one. It was still pretty new. So obviously, I have a huge amount of respect for anyone who does uh, open source, because it's a lot of hard work. Uh, you have to deal with assholes like me. Uh, opening requests, you know, bugs, all that stuff. Um, but HV Builder didn't hold up. It didn't hold up because it was a bit outdated. It had a lot of baggage, you know, code uh, goes through some sort of atrophy in the end where you have to rewrite or refactor a lot. And I'm guessing there were some constraints. But HTTP Builder, uh, on the bottom line, well, it fell behind. And it's not good anymore. So you might have heard some jokes about it, jokes maybe I've made <laughs> about it. Uh, and other talks where if you'd want to use the library, normally you would have to, in, maybe in the best case, you'd have to look into the source code to understand how to use the library itself. And I think that's a good sign of maybe not such a well-written API if I have to read source code to know how to use it. So we're continuing to the next level, uh, NG. So now we're no longer enemies, we are friends. So. NG isn't uh, a fork uh, of the old one. It's also not really a rewrite because there was so much baggage and so much things that had to change. They basically uh, written the client ground up. And the good thing about HP Builder NG is it's, it's not an HTTP client. It's a wrapper around popular HTTP clients, which is why I asked you in the beginning uh, your preferred client type. So. There's less messing around with the internals, less chance of bugs, because this thing has already been written. How to make HTTP requests is a library which already exists and it's already written. No need to rewrite it, but let's groovify it, rather. And how would one start using HTTP Builder NG? Well, you've got the source code um, over there and the URL on the screen, and you've got also the really good documentation. It has improved in the past months. I've heard some people say, Oh, I've tried using HP Builder NG a couple of months ago. You know, it didn't really work out. I uh, didn't really understand how to use it. But the guys have improved the source, uh, also the source documentation, and also the, the documentation page itself. 
quite a bit. So it's worth taking a look again if you've been burned in the past. And also, extra huge props for the two guys who make it happen, uh, Chris and David. Really cool guys, did an excellent work, and mad props to them. Because like I said, uh, contributing to uh, open source is very demanding, and it's even harder to design good APIs. Rather than, you know, you answer mailing lists all day, you commit your code, you take your bugs. This is hard work. Designing a good API is even harder. And these guys, I believe, have managed to do it. So we've talked about different implementations. And these are the implementations that are currently available to you should you choose to use HP Builder and G. You can use the core Java, like this brave fellow over here. You can use OKHTP. And you can also use the Apache HP components. So you're basically reusing what you've already been using up until now. So it's all still familiar grounds, but with a wrapper. And how would one install such a library? So um, like I said, it's a shared core, OK, but different implementations. And you can choose which implementation you want to use. You don't have to come and use the whole bundle or use clients which maybe you're not wanting to use today. Like maybe if you're using OK but you don't use Apache, you don't have to. You have different dependencies for different types uh, of implementations. So if you want to use core, you just uh, depend on the compile ng core. You'll notice a pattern here. If you want to uh, depend on Apache, then it's just another uh, suffix. And the same with OKHTP. So I personally prefer OKHTP. It's pretty modern. It supports quite a few uh, cool features, which Apache doesn't. Um, and Square are a really good company. I mean, the quality of code that they produce and uh, donate to open source is extremely good. But you notice there's something missing here. There's no Maven dependency declaration here. And that's because none of you should be using Maven. So now that I know how to install a library, how would I use it? So you'll see a lot of talk from me about patterns coming around. You see a pattern in dependencies. You see a pattern in the usage. You also see it in the way that the code to consume it is written. And the simplest way to use it today using the core HTTP uh, in Java is that you declare your import, you declare your builder to configure, and you're set to go. But let's notice um, a few things here, first of all, and you see them recurring. First off, is it the consistent namespace? So no matter what implementation you use, okay, it'll always start with Groovy X, Net, HTTP, so on. And the other consistent part is the configuration method. No matter what implementation you, you use, you would always initialize the new client using HTTP Builder dot configure. So this is how you initialize the core. How would you initialize uh, Apache or Square? You might ask yourself. So Simple as that. You import a new client, um, Apache HTTP Builder, and you insert that into the configuration closure. So you basically use exactly the same configure method, but this time you're telling uh, the library, no, 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 don't use the core. Here's a different implementation. Use that. So you'll notice that configure not only works uh, with no parameters at all, it also works with a factory function. But all sorts of configurations can go on in here because Basically, the closure receives a configuration object, which you pass on to the implementation. But you can still play around with this object, inspect it, do whatever you like with it. Um, it's, it's all open still. And OKHTP, exactly the same, just modification of one word instead of Apache, OKHTP. And you'll notice how simple it is to switch between implementations. And it might seem trivial, but I think that is actually an important feature. Because if you already committed to a certain client, and all your code uses that specific client, and you didn't properly wrap it up through uh, good layers of abstraction, then switching that client would be problematic. Now, when would you switch a client? Because you might think to yourself, maybe it's a, like a far-off scenario. I would never use it. And actually, something that happened to me was that I was using an Apache client. Uh, I was fairly happy with it. And at a certain point, I faced a bug. And that bug specifically was I had to authenticate two ways. One, authenticate to a proxy I was connecting to, and then authenticate to a service uh, outside uh, my network. So I had to go through a proxy, authenticate with a the proxy, then authenticate with the external service, which I'm actually interested in talking to. 
And there was a bug. There was a bug which wouldn't let me do that with both authentications. Now, obviously, you'd report a bug, you'd look for a workaround, but because some organizations move slower than others, you might not get a satisfying solution quick enough. For example, Apache, fine, there's a bug open, but until it's released, until it's tested, until it's solved, whatnot, you can wait a long, long time. And you probably don't want to use your own compiled uh, version of it just to fix the bug, I'm guessing. So I had a really hard time switching that client afterwards because I couldn't use it. I had to use another one. So now I had clients sitting around. I had to replace it. I had to make sure now I'm using different APIs and they're all broken. So the ability to switch this configuration just with one keyword, I'm sitting in the same request, doing the get request, doing the post request, just changed one factory method, and I'm using a completely different implementation. And that's how easy it is, should you face such an issue which would force you to change the provider. It's all down to one keyword, just different implementation, and the exact same API for every method you want to achieve. That's a few features aside, but we'll talk about that later. So now that we've initialized the configuration, we talked about the interchangeability, how do you use it? Simple enough, you take the configuration object, and just like you, the APIs you're familiar with, you invoke it with either get, post, patch, just the different methods which you're interested in executing. Now you'll notice also that you've got another hook into the configuration. That's a configuration closure. So you've got access to uh, the URIs, maybe things like um, authentication or cookies. These are accessible through the configuration closure, which receives um, uh, uh, the call site has access to the request object. And the same thing goes also for the method itself. You don't have to call the method with no parameters. You can also uh, call the method with another configuration closure and then carry on configuring, which means you can also separate them. And I'll just talk about it right now because you might want the same configuration for the whole client, but different configurations for different method implementations, and this lets you do that. Okay? And here's another pattern which you should observe. There's the configuration and the method invocation, one after the other, where you can chain it. And it's the same, um, uh, it's basically you use the same client implementation and only the method changes. So here's another uh, facet of reusability which the library gives you. Now, we, we can use the request you can see in the configuration, we can use the request uh, during the method, uh, which you might want to extend to different uh, authentication schemes or different cookies for the same thing. Um, and you can also have uh, different handlers for the response as well. So you might know that if you're using a, a, the HP Builder currently, you know that you can have like an unsuccess closure, an unfailure closure, uh, that sort of thing. So you might be saying to yourself, you know, well, la -di da you can do get requests and all that, you can do forms and these sort of things, but I'm already doing it today. So why would I want to use HP Builder NG instead? You know, you might be saying, simple demo, where's the real issues? How does it have me solve real world issues, like fixing the economy or whatever? Well, the client can't help you fix the economy, but it can help you do things way easier than you're doing today, I assure you. So let's talk about these things now. You probably, most of you recognize this sort of pattern using, uh, trying to deal with headers, headers of different types, headers of different values. You know, maybe it's like six o'clock in the evening, you're in the office, you have to call your, your wife or your husband and say, sorry, honey, I can't make it home today. Uh, I won't be in time for dinner. I have to pass and handle 200 different types of headers which I'm receiving right now. Um, I might be home in time for pension, we'll see. Um, so you can see that you have different types of headers here. Each one has a specific way that needs to be handled because of the different data types and different sort of meaning which they have. So last modify would be a date uh, or a timestamp, so is age. But con content uh, uh, disposition is something completely different. It's like a multi-valued map. So everything needs a specific uh, code to handle it in the end. And that creates a lot of boilerplate code because you might have a utility to handle it, but maybe different core sites of a certain HTTP method requires different handling. Maybe I need to handle last modified uh, using a, a certain timestamp parser, but another place needs a different timestamp parser. It can be hell sometimes. So luckily for you, HTTP Builder handles most of the common types for you. 
So there is an automatic parsing mechanism which basically takes typical headers and does the conversion to their data types for you already. For example, uh, a list of uh, allowed hosts would be converted to a CSV list type. Last modified, as discussed, will be automatically converted to HP date. Um, cache control, if you're using solo caches, then in the end it gets translates into the map types, which means there's loads and loads of types of headers which now you no longer have to parse by yourself anymore. No more like index of a semicolon and then split, and then is it a map, does it have a value, doesn't it have a value, is it matrix parameters, all that is gone. And not only those, there's a huge list of all the supported headers which uh, they already auto parse and they handle already for you. So this is really, really useful because as discussed before, you can now make it in time for dinner. You no longer have to pass your own headers. And how would it look like, uh, you might ask yourself. Uh, really easy. You see the same pattern, configuration pattern, the method uh, invocation pattern. And now, if you take a close look, I have a couple of things here. Okay, so first, I might be interested in making a head request, just like in this example. I want to know maybe the timestamp um, of a certain resource. Okay, so first, I can declare my uh, return type, which is a date time object. And now, how do I pass the header? Okay, now, this isn't a standard header, is it date? It's just one where I made up, or maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, just something I wrote down. But you can use your own auto parser for it. Okay, and the way you use it is basically you configure the closure to accept the response from the on success. Okay. And when you iterate the headers, you just find the relevant header and pass it. And well, that's it, basically. That's all you have to do. Just because there's already the list of known types, it already knows how to handle it, and it does everything for you. All you have to do is call pass. Super simple. Now, how about content rather than headers? Okay, maybe you have the same familiar situation. Um, sometimes you have to pass different types of contents, right? Not, not all the world is using JSON. Sometimes you have to pass HTML or XML, God forbid, or CSV, uh, you know. Uh, but again, the client already does that all for you. So it takes the content type, normally um, according to the header. Sometimes there's a bit of smarter logic to figure out what sort of type it, there is, but it auto detects the type and then it already passes it itself. So uh, you can use uh, HTML parsing. Uh, if you depend on libraries like JSOUP or Neko HTML, uh, the parsing will be done for you. If you want to use perhaps JSON, so when you use Groovy, you have like the Groovy JSON native parser or the Jackson library to, uh, to parse it. Uh, and also CSV as well. I hope you're not using CSV, but if you have to, so uh, you can use CSV together with the open CSV library and pass all the content through that. That's extremely useful. And also there's a fallback for just, well, plain old text, yeah? But the point is you do not have to do it yourself. That's a recurring point as well. And what happens if you want to have your own parsers? Well, I'm glad to tell you you can do that as well. And that's another facet of reuse. If you have uh, uh, code addressing different HP resources which handle the same types of contents, you do not have to replicate this type of parsing across different sites. You need only one point to give it to, and that's the method invocation. So the same way, you configure the, uh, the, the, the client, you invoke the get method, you notice once more that there's uh, the return content type, which is string. But in this case, something a little different ha happens here. It's not typical content parsing like HTML or, uh, or maybe JSON. This time I'm doing it with a, you know, an archive, maybe a gzip file or uh, an ordinary zip file, doesn't really matter. But the point is, I can instruct um, response with using the parser method and tell it right now, Every time, right now, you encounter content type of application zip, this is what you have to do. And it's what, what I uh, instruct in the closure. So you specify the content type, you give it a configuration closure, which tells it how to handle the different contents. So it means I request a zip file, I get a response, the client says, okay, fine, it's an application.zip. Oh, I have a registered closure. And this closure knows what to do with the zip stream. 
And in this case, you can see I construct a new zip stream. Um, because it's nice and groovy, I can also just directly get the text, not meddle around with the streamy stuff. Um, I have a string directly in two lines. And this will happen every time I encounter this type of data. And it's not only for, uh, for incoming, uh, like headers uh, or response content. I can also do this for requests as well. So if I want to do a recurring operation for every request I do across my whole application, I just have to do exactly the same thing. And it's super easy. It's just one closure mapped to one content type. Bam, do something. And you can do it by uh, different uh, sort of parameters. You can do it by uh, method type. You can do it by content type. You decide. In the end, it's all up to you. So, for example, I had um, a certain situation where every request uh, which I sent, including some sort of content, had to have some sort of audit, which means if I want to send a JSON payload, it's not enough that I send the JSON payload itself. It needed maybe a timestamp or a unique token or something which will help with the audit to say this request originated from point A and it reached point B, a sort of uh, maybe a receipt, if you want for the content type. Now, if I had to go across my whole application and at every point making a post or put request, I had to go and somehow put in this receipt into the JSON content, that would be a nightmare, a complete nightmare. Instead, once again, inside my client, I can just put this small piece of code and say, every request, do this. Every request, do that. So once again, I, uh, I have this configuration closure which does a really simple operation and applies to all the methods. And in this case, I might re uh, do a get request. So I call interceptor, same way that I called parser in, in, the, uh, in the former example. And I tell it, right now, interceptor, for every get method you prepare or make or execute, I want you to do the following closure. And once again, you have uh, access to the whole configuration you have access to the original function that is about to be executed, just like you wanted to. But you can perform any sort of operation you like. Perhaps uh, it's printing to a certain access log. Perhaps it's enriching the content somehow. But the thing is, you get a hook right before the method is invoke, invoked. You can do whatever you like. And then you have a handle to the original method, and you can just execute it whenever you want. But also notice um, avoid bugs and notice that fx.apply, the original function, depends on the return value. Okay, so the return value of the closure I've built here has to be the return value of the original method. Otherwise, well, you, won't re you will never receive the result from your method, which you try to execute. So you've got the configuration, you've got the method, and then just simply do the business, and then, well, profit, if you watch South Park. Um, but it's not only limited to one method type. You can do it with multiple method types, get, post, put, delete, patch, whatever. All you have to do is specify an array of those values, and you're good to go. It's exactly the same thing. And the nice thing about it is that it doesn't have to be only for the outgoing data, right? And it, can it can also be for the incoming data, because if you remember, I talked about how you execute the original method and you return the value. You can also meddle around with that. You can take the value returned by the original method and modify it once more, just before being returned to the client. And it's as simple as that. It's just a simple invocation. You get the result after everything has been executed, and then you have another hook to handle into it. So there's a lot of messing around here with the content and stuff like that. Um, I really like it. Yeah? And it really gives you a lot of power, a lot of power in terms of not um, the ability in itself, because you can write HTTP interceptors today or method interceptors using AOP and all that stuff, but it gives you the power to be right at the point of where the business is done and reuse that code. And another really, really cool feature of this uh, are the encoders. Okay, uh, We talked about maybe uh, enriching different uh, types of data. We did this um, in the previous slide with the type of method. So what if I want to perform a certain operation but on a data type rather than the type of method that gets executed? Well, I can do this too. 
same example with a JSON payload. I have to stamp each JSON payload, for example, with a, with a specific timestamp. I can do that. And rather than, say, do it on every get or post or patch op op operation, I can do it according to the content type, exactly the same way. I get a handle uh, to the data that's being sent. I get a handle to the, uh, to the content. So everything's under my control. So I just call encoder. Once I call encoder, I tell encoder which content type I'm interested in. In this case, it's application JSON. I want to stamp every application JSON that, that uh, leaves my, my system. Okay. Uh, and then I have a handle to my, to, uh, to my original request, and I just pass on the, the data after it was uh, already augmented by me, just to the original method. So super simple, uh, super convenient, and extremely reusable. So don't repeat yourself, clean code, all that. This is a really, really big uh, plus for this library, which lets you reuse so much code. Now, if you're not using uh, Groovy in production, you'll be happy to know that you can also use HP Builder together with Java. So with the power of lambdas and functions and stuff like that, you can use it as well. Just instead of closures, use functions. Really simple. Um, you can also uh, well build your own, uh, so to speak. So I've talked about specific implementations like Core, like uh, Apache HTTP and OKHTTP. But what if you have your own? What if you're using like uh, I don't know, Panda HTTP. I don't know what Panda HTTP is. I just made that up. But what, you might be using it. Uh, so you can write your own implementation. And all you have to do is extend one specific class called HTTP Builder. Okay? Uh, this class serves two methods. One, the object configuration. So you've seen in the different patterns we've talked about in the different examples, basically, we've been passing around a huge configuration object from each one, controlling the request, controlling the cookies, and whatnot. So you get to manage that as well using your own client. And basically, what you have to do is just construct it, return it on request, very simple. Uh, and you can also get access to the type of executor you have. So if you're using maybe uh, multi-threaded requests, you know, a request pool and having a multi-request at the same time, then you can also get to decide what executor to use, because you might not be using the standard Java. Maybe you have your own implementation. So when you extend the HTTP Builder class, uh, there's not much to do. You have to implement a set of methods, get, head, post, put, delete. Uh, I think there's uh, already patch as well, which you can do. Um, I have to check that. But uh, you can basically hook in to every implementation and either handle it yourself or delegate it to the standard implementation as well. Now, this is really, really good in a case where you have a different type of implementation, but it's also really good when you want to test things. So obviously, when you do HTTP testing or when you want to test uh, your system, you don't want to make real-life calls to an HTTP server. I mean, you might set up a mock server, which will handle these requests, but it's more setup, it's more uh, infrastructure to use, and it's more points of failure when all you want to make sure is these requests get executed as expected. So having this sort of extensibility where you can build your own means you can also build your own uh, mock client, which is then just tested. So I've done a lot of talking till now. So let's see some examples, right? I'll just switch over to IntelliJ. Excellent. OK, so I've put through a few examples uh, of the things we've been talking about. Just. Um, and just let's uh, see how it works in the real world. So first, let's take a look at a small server I've written. So you heard probably Ratpack being thrown around. Uh, Ratpack is an excellent uh, server in itself, and I'll be using it in this demo too because it's just so easy to uh, build small applications with it. So I've got a really simple Ratpack server here. It's a groovy script. Not a, it's like the most simplified form of Ratpack. It doesn't use classes or anything. And I uh, configure two handlers here, handlers or controllers, if you're coming from the uh, full stack world. And I've got two handlers. One, uh, a simple GET request uh, with no path, just the root uh, path of the, of the server. And another GET request that can be handled is for when I request a certain archive. Oops. <laughs> so, OK. So what happens is I get a request um, to the root server, 
Okay, I add a new uh, date um, to the uh, to, to the headers, just like a simple date, and then I render hello great conf in the response. And similar thing when I request an archive in the path, I just specify my content type, which is the gzip, specify the nicely hard coded path here. Don't do this at home, or at work. Uh, and then I just I'll fire up the server, and we can start testing it. So let's see what sort of examples we have here. Let's look at the content parser. So if you remember, we've talked about how can I take content returned to me from the server and modify it on request. So this is the example. I access my Ratpack server at port 5050, and I request the archive GZ. As you recall, I have an archive waiting to be served at that path. And what happens is I call my parser, and I tell my parser on every instance of gzip, I would like to do the following thing, the following thing being my configuration closure. In this case, very simple scenario, what I do is I take the stream and I pass it as a gzip and I return the string result. Let's see how it works. So you'll have to take my word for it, but the archive represents uh, <laughs> just a compressed version of the string testing. So as you can see, that's the result. I've got the, uh, the stream coming in. I've got the text going out and printed. The, te the text is testing. So that completed successfully. That's very nice. I can also uh, intercept the response that we've spoken of. So if I make a request to the root resource of the Ratpack server um, with whatever uh, method I want, OK? So I have here the different verbs to execute. Uh, in this case, I'll be executing only the get verb. So let's see how that works as well. Same thing. I access port 5050, I do a simple get request, and then I print the result. But the result won't be the original result, it won't be hello great conf, it'll be some augmented version. The augmented version being the configuration method I've given here. Configuration method to apply to those different types of HTTP methods. So let's ex execute that as well. So you can see I've printed here the full body response. That's the original response being hello great conf. But then the last statement being the return value is magic marker and then the original text. And that eventually gets printed at the end. So you see, really cool. I can change just any content on per type of request. What if we look at uh, passing the headers as we spoke of in the beginning? So as you also remember, my original root resource uh, adds a special date header onto it, and we're going to pass it right now. So same thing, exactly the same thing. I make a head request. I declare the return value, which is the date time, and I instruct my configuration closure that upon success, we look for a header named date, and then we're just going to pass it, the passing being delegated onto HP Builder obviously. So we can see my return type class is zone daytime. That's the expected type. And the date itself being properly passed as well. That's the original date string timestamp. So again, really convenient, really easy, almost zero configuration, but highly reusable. So we've also talked about maybe building a test client. So I've already done that as well for you. I've done a small uh, uh, test here. Let's look at the custom client spec. So I've written one spec method. Uh, I'm querying Serenity. I'm asking Serenity, what's your status? And I expect the status to be all good. I expect the status to be shiny. So you can see I've used my own configuration here, OK? And I provide the factory with the Serenity test client. Now. It's a special client because first, it does what I tell it to do and doesn't go in and execute real world requests. It's made for testing, which means uh, it returns just whatever you tell it to return. It documents all the requests that uh, have been made, so you can audit that, uh, uh, for test purposes later. But no real HP methods are being executed. So let's look at the client for one moment. If you can remember, uh, we talked about extending HP Builder. 
Now, I was lazy. I implemented almost nothing here, but you get the point. Um, but I did implement the get method. So get method will, will always return shiny. And every request coming in will be documented in the request log. And the request log was given from the test, so it can also later be inspected by the test. So if we go back to the test, I configure it using the Serenity test client. I declare my test URI, which is just a dummy URI. It doesn't really matter because there's no real implementation. And then I execute a get request where I expect my uh, content type to be a string. And the request is done to a path at slash status. And what marks a successful uh, uh, test in, in this case? First, well, that the test actually returns shiny because it was hard coded. It would be really weird if it didn't return it. Um, and that the request log actually logged my request, that I have one request being performed to the expected, uh, to the expected path. So let's try and run the spec. So the spec is successful. You can see that the test client was initialized. It returned, uh, uh, it, it returned the response to get request. And that um, basically all the conditions of set have been up to successfully. So that's really, really convenient. So as you can imagine, you can write even your own uh, HTTP server stub and then just replace it according to environment, according to configuration in your own application. So you don't have to change anything in your production code in order to test it. Just switch implementations. Um, so I hope you are uh, impressed <laughs> as I was when I first saw this, because this is really, really cool stuff. So let's go back to the um, presentation. So that concludes the demo. Um, are there any uh, questions about what you saw here today? You're all too much in shock, I can tell. You're dying to get home and try it out for yourself. <laughs> well, you should. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, please. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, I'm sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it should be possible, but I'm probably going to have to check it because you do have access to the response object, which means you have access to the response stream. <laughs> oh, you're asking if there's any pre-prepared events. Right. Right. I don't think there is, but I'll have to check it. But it sounds like a cool feature if it doesn't exist. Yeah, great. Okay, um, cool. So thank you so much. Had a great time.